Rachin is the managing partner of E2MC Ventures, a space-focused venture capital firm. He is also the author of, I don't know how to pronounce this, Hoke Hines, I'm guessing at that. Uh, okay, you'll have to, yeah. Hines, okay. Uh, I don't know what that means. You're gonna to have to answer that. Uh, it's an introductory book on space business lecture. He lectures on space entrepreneurship at several universities and hosts the Space Business Podcast. Uh, both I and James Burke at the Moon Society were on his podcast in the last couple of weeks, so that was really fun. Uh, uh, Raphael is a chartered financial analyst. He invests in space companies. He is the author, I just said that, um, the host of Space Business Podcast and contributing editor to Space Watch Global, also an ISU alum. Um, he's a partner in Space for Impact and lectures on space finance and entrepreneurship at several universities. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We're going to bring you on now. I'm going to be quiet. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Michael. So let me share my screen. A second. Okay, and, and by the way, it's great to see so many ISU people. So I actually quickly changed my shirt and put on my uh, ISU uh, swag here. <laughs> In any event, um, so I titled my talk Opening the Moon for Business, which I think we all want to do here. And if you're a science fiction fan like me, you may recognize the cover picture here. This is from the movie Ad Astra. This is depicting the moon base. And I mean, there's obviously many depictions of moon bases in, um, in science fiction, starting with, well, not starting with, but for example, um, as early as the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, Clavius crater base, right? But what I really want to point out here, I, I really like this picture, right? Because you see clear signs of commercial activity. If you if you zoom in a little bit, you can see, I, I'm pretty sure it's a DHL sign, right? The, the yellow sign in the middle. And then to the right of that, which I like even more, you have the cowboy, right? I think it's in the US, it's called Vegas, Vegas Vic, right? Which is probably, I'm pretty sure, is some sort of like nightclub or bar or something like that. And I put this here because we probably all agree, well, I'm not sure we all agree, but probably many people think this is where we want to get to, right? This is the easy part. This is, this is the end goal. The question is, how can we get there? Um, you already went to my background, so I'm going to skip that. So what we, what we have done so far, I mean, I think everybody here on, uh, on this call, this type of conference knows we've done the so-called flags and footsteps missions, uh, six successful um, uh, moon landings, uh, crude moon landings, 12 people who walked on the moon, all male, all American. The longest time we spend on the moon surface, 75 hours, so really not a whole lot of time. And we brought absolutely everything that's necessary to survive there, mostly in the form of the lunar module. We've, we've done even more uncrewed missions. I think just the US has, has done, uh, I think, way over 30. The USSR has, and, and Russia have all, also landed on the moon, China as well. And a lot of other nations have either flown around the moon or tried to land, like recently, Israel and India. Okay, but again, um, the flex and footsteps is what we had so far. There might be an intermediate step, which I would call like the research station type presence. And on the top here in the middle, you have the, the South Pole research station. And then I'm sorry, on the bottom, I couldn't find a good science fiction depiction of a research station on the moon. This is, this is from the movie The Martian, as you probably know. And on the right, you have, again, a depiction of um, from science fiction of what a future bigger lunar base could look like. This is from one of my favorite TV series, The Expanse. So you see the base on top and on the bottom, sort of the type of activity I think we ultimately want to be able to enjoy on the moon as well, just having a nice drink with friends. But again, the question is, how do we get there? And so on this slide, I basically added to the same categories, the type of people who would go on these missions. So flags and footsteps, that was obviously professional astronauts. For the research stations, presumably it would be scientists, maybe some service staff to run the station or protect the station, and possibly some high-end tourists. Of course, once we really get to a self-sustained, self-sustaining settlements, the idea is that we would have average people there and that maybe tourists or maybe people who work in some sort of function on the moon. Okay, moving on, adding another aspect here. So what do we need for this different type of missions? Uh, for the flags and footsteps missions, we basically need needed and still need a transport capability. Once you move to research stations where people may stay a little bit longer than the 75 hours that was the longest time during the Apollo missions, well, we will need basic infrastructure, life support systems and so forth, we we'll get to that. But then for the sustained, for the self-sustaining, sustained presence, we really need a reason to come and ideally to stay. And we'll talk about that. So let's go through all of these different elements. 
So starting with the transfer capability, and I'm pretty optimistic. I mean, it, it looks pretty good. I mean, on the on the left, you have the recent Chinese, um, obviously uncrewed lunar lander that uh, actually brought back a sample. And it seemed so routine. It seemed so easy the way they did that. And of course, on the right, and with apologies if there's anybody on the call from the national team or from Dynetics, but it's obviously the Lunar Starship. And um, yeah, excuse me, I'm a, I'm a SpaceX fanboy. And um, may, may I say I also pay taxes in the US. So I'm a fan of the SpaceX Lunar Starship. And so I think, you know, as I believe many people on this call share this opinion, you keep on talking about the, um, the Starship singularity. This, this really would make a massive difference, the type of transport capability and capacity that Starship would represent to the lunar surface. So pretty optimistic on transport capability, to be honest. Okay, talking about basic infrastructure, um, starting with this slide, that's just reminding people that the moon is a harsh place, and this is why you need some special infrastructure. Um, actually, the distance, the travel time, and the communications latency, I'm less worried about. Um, I'm a big fan of studying history, and if you go back to the time of the exploration of the Earth, or even like just some two or three hundred years when we used to go to places like, let's say, England to Australia, well, that was a six months journey on a ship, and the communications delay was basically six months. So the moon with today's technologies, that's pretty good, actually. Of course, some of the other stuff is pretty harsh, really. Like there's, there's no air, the water is in the form of ice, there's definitely no food there right now, and the temperature swings are pretty brutal. You're on a hot vacuum, there's lots of radiation, and there is micrograph. Well, one six gravity in the Earth. I put the mass values for reference as well, but I think probably most people on this call are familiar with these values anyway. But of course, because of this harsh environment, we need basic infrastructure. If we want even an Antarctica style research base there, right? We need energy. That's probably the most um, uh, elementary need of them all because that drives everything else. We will need environmental control and life support systems or ECLIS as we call it. If you want to do anything more interesting, we will need communication systems, navigation systems. I forgot to put it on here, but probably a sort of systematic uh, remote sensing capability around the moon so that we can observe things. Launch and landing facilities, um, spaceports, whatever you want to call them, or just pads, whatever. Habitats, well, kind of buildings, right? Habitats for, for um, where crew could live, or storage facilities for, for food or, or greenhouses. Um, medical attention because it is a few days back to earth so if, if there's an emergency you will want to be able to at least take care of some medical emergencies and that's actually the reason i put the picture on the left um that's sort of an interesting story that some of you may know um this is a russian guy called rogozov who was um who in the 1960s was at the antarctic research station of the soviet union and he was the only trained physician he got appendicitis so he had to self-operate and so this is just to say that it's probably good to have some basic medical attention on the moon as well, which is a few days away from, from Earth. And the last point I put is um, it would be nice to have just the publicly available uh, data on, on the moon. And this is why like if efforts like the Moon Society's uh, Wiki, um, I think those are, those are valuable efforts. Okay, so this is the infrastructure part. Let's move on to the next part. Um, if we really want to sustain present, we need a reason to come and to stay. I'm going to start again with science fiction and an anti-example. This is from, again, if you know science fiction, this is from Man in Black 3, where you have a maximum security prison on the moon. But I think that's ideally not the use case we want, even though there is, of course, terrestrial uh, precedent with the exploration of Australia. Let's talk about some other use cases. And many of those have been mentioned already so far by previous speakers. I mean, science is an obvious one. Testing, a test the moon as a testing ground for deep space a staging location for other locations. I mean, it's just uh, significantly easier um, to get off the, the moon surface than the, the Earth surface. It's much less of a gravity well. Natural resources has been mentioned uh, a few times. I mean, there's obviously um, the water ice, which you can process into hydrogen and oxygen, which you can use as rocket fuel and oxidizer, or we can use it for the oxygen for life support as well. And for this natural resource case, it's really quite interesting, right? Because again, that's where we look back at Earth's history and we have a lot of precedent, a lot of settlement of um, certain regions in Earth originally occurred, at least helped by natural resources. So the various gold rushes, right? The California gold rush, the, um, the Klondike gold rush in the North Yukon, um, even including some very um, harsh regions. For example, there's, if you know, there's an archipelago north of the polar circle, which is called um, Svalbard. Uh, originally settled as well for uh, for things including the exploration of natural resources. Tourism 
uh, entertainment. And I put the example here of um, you know, some people planning a remote controlled car race on the moon, but I think there could be many other examples, maybe sports and some other things. Uh, funny enough, we just mentioned in, in the last, um, I think, discussion of collector's items. And um, it's really interesting to think what else? We need, we need a killer app for the moon. And of course, the pictures here, um, I already mentioned the car race. And on the left, it's the tourism example, right? That's Yusako Mezawa, who paid SpaceX a lot of money, not disclosed, but you can sort of triangulate. It's probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars to do an Apollo 8-style mission on Starship in the next few years. Okay, another thing, it's not exactly infrastructure, but I'm gonna mention it at this point because it sort of fits in. Um, if we want investment, the sustained presence um, on, on, on the moon, we also need, um, as an investor, I want to have sort of um, slash governance so it's a stable business. And that can basically happen in a couple of ways. One is you have an agreed and accepted legal framework um, but very importantly, and so for example, like the Artemis Accords, but very importantly, you need an enforcement capability. Um, look, look, one, of the, one of my nationalities is, is Brazilian, and uh, without picking too much on the Brazilians, um, we, we have a lot of laws. The problem is many of them are not enforced. And let me tell you, it, it doesn't work. So the laws are useless unless there's an enforcement capability. And maybe it's going to be Space Force, maybe it's going to be something else, but you do need the enforcement capability if you use that route. The other way to get to some sort of um, government slash security, which I probably prefer because it's not dependent on governments, is just game theory. And that's to some extent the Wild West. And on the left here, you have the Mexican standoff scenario, right? It's just, I'm not going to do anything bad to you because if I do something bad, you're going to do something bad to me. And in the end, we will both lose out and our, both of our businesses will suffer. But a general point being here, a stable environment for business in terms of government security, that's important. Okay, coming back to the slides where we had the various types of missions and where we want to get to. Um, now, if you look at the last row, I basically, um, the last row here is meant to indicate where the financing is most likely to come from. So the flags and footsteps types missions, of course, it's mostly, if not exclusively, public money, government money. If it's a research station, it's probably mostly public. Maybe we have some public-private partnerships as um, commercial actors get interested in you know, testing a few things, having minimal viable products, having proof of concepts, in anticipation of then a, a bigger lunar economy, which should really be driven mostly by private actors. And so let's look a little bit at what um, how private investors might be motivated. Of course, my main role, as, um, as Michael said in the introduction, is as a, as a space venture investor, so I qualify for that. And so here I put um, the investment criteria we use internally at E2MC Ventures, uh, which is a seed stage space investor. So it's not necessarily the best example for, for the moon, but in any event. So let me just quickly run through those. We look at the team and the team, it's important for us that somebody knows what they're doing also on the technical side. So if we had to look at the moon company, we would want to have somebody who understands the moon aspects. But there are people like that around, not too many, but we can find people like that. The second point is very complicated for the moon right now, which is the market potential, precisely because we don't know yet what the really um, viable commercial business cases on the moon are. Nothing is proven yet. So one slight way around that, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's cheating, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a way around that is that we sometimes look at is companies that have what I would call a, a dual use type business case and not dual use in the in the in the usual sense we use it like civil and military but dual use in the sense that well maybe they make a product that will ultimately be very helpful on the moon but we can also sell it um, to terrestrial customers in the meantime and there's a few examples like that you know like mining equipment or technology that's obviously going to be case um, we want to see that there is a, a through business model uh, the next one exit potential the question mark at the moment for, for the moon, um, ultimately, what could be the exit route, whether it's a sale or a listing for those companies. The execution plan, I'm going to come back on the next slide. The main problem there is the time frame for most lunar businesses. Moving over to the right column, de-risking elements. That could be, for example, um, the public sector supporting it in, in some way with non-dilutive financing or loan guarantees or um, being an anchor customer. And that's very, very important, I believe, for the moon, as many other speakers before me have already indicated, and I'll come back to that. A portfolio fit that's uh, specific to our fund, so I won't uh, go into detail on that. Um, our ability to add value is also specific to our fund. Co-investors is also less relevant, positive impact, and gut feel. Okay, so really the main problem here, if you look at our typical investor criteria, and the reason probably we haven't invested in any lunar 
company yet is, uh, and that's probably, I suspect, this similar for most other space investors like, like Michael on this call here as well, Michael Mealing, is, is the market potential? What's really a, a business case? Okay, um, in a similar vein, I put down some typical investor concerns uh, when we talk about investing in space. And this is from our experience when we go fundraising as a venture fund as well and try to convince um, potential investors to invest in our fund and, in the space, and thereby in the space economy at large. I mean, it's deep tech, right? And that's just um, just generally, some people are scared that you don't understand it and that's, that's fair. The second point is valid for lunar, for many lunar business models. Um, they can be very capital intensive, of course. It costs a lot of money right now to, to take one kilogram to the moon. It still costs millions of dollars. Um, the third bullet point we already mentioned, this is the long time frame to revenues and then to exit. And that's probably the case for pretty much any lunar business we can think of right now. And keep in mind, um, you may or may not notice, but for like a fund like ours, a venture fund, most venture funds, sort of the upper end of the lifetime of the fund is 10 years. And I mean, there's, there's one or two funds out there which have 15 years, but that's then really the upper end for what typically be seven to 10 years. So, um, and, and really ideally you wouldn't want to be able to exit your investments in the time frame again, otherwise it gets complicated. And this is another complication when we talk about lunar business models. Certainly scarcity of successful exits to that used a general bullet point uh, concern people had about generally the space sector. Recently that's gotten a little bit better, uh, largely thanks to SPACs. Um, but certainly uh, since we haven't seen any lunar company SPAC yet, arguably um, it's still a concern here. And the last bullet point that's actually not relevant for moon, for lunar companies. Okay, so the question is then, what what can be done given this this reality that I just laid out in these various concerns? What can be done to still incentivize private investment on the moon? For me, and this has again, I'm not the first one to mention it. Uh, this conference is, it's about de-risking as much as possible. So and this could be and, and de-risking this will be mostly by governments and government entities, right? It doesn't have to be but probably mostly. So for example, providing and financing the basic infrastructure we talked about, like most basic example would be like an energy and life support infrastructure, providing a business friendly framework. So this is what we talked about, the legal framework or an enforcement capability, acting as an anchor customer. Also other speakers have already mentioned it, acting as a co-investor and uh, providing any sort of other incentives, tax credits, favorable fa labor laws, maybe some sort of regulatory arbitrage. You're allowed to do something on the moon that maybe on earth in certain places you're not allowed to do. I'm not talking about um, really bad examples, but you know, just something maybe that um, on, on earth people wouldn't want it in their backyard, but on the moon, the backyard is much bigger. Subsidies. And, and maybe we should think about something like a lunar development zone where we basically combine some of these um, incentives. And then I encourage you to think of what else we could do there. And once, once though, um, because I'm very much a free markets guy, once the governments have provided this de-risking, I also very much believe they should get out of the way and just let entrepreneurs do their thing because usually that, that works. Okay, and so who can help with all of this? And this is uh, mostly focused on sort of also where can the financing come from? And of course, governments in their various forms, whether it's um, space agencies, military agencies um, or, or other entities, that's obviously a key one. It could be multinational entities, like we have the European Space Agency here in Europe. We talked a lot about public-private partnerships already. There could also be private consortia. There could be individual private actors who just really want to use their, their wealth. And that could be companies or individuals who want to use their wealth to advance the lunar economy. What a crowd, like really people at large, retail investors, many, many people combined. And I put a few pictures here um, on, um, on the right, basically to... Um, Give some examples since you may know some of them on the top that's um one of the dams of all right sure. so the um the big five this is from the history of hawaii those were basically sugar barons and they um arguably contributed a lot to the development of the islands because they had this business interest in sugar it's probably a controversial example because they also exerted a lot of uh, political influence were probably a cartel but i put it here anyway as an example of a private consortium helping to develop a geographic place on the left um the thing in sort of the light brown um you may, you may be able to read it. It's a stock certificate of something called the South Sea Company, which was a, a stock, a listed stock in the UK in the early 18th century, the peak around 1720. And it's an example of several bubbles we had in the early stock markets, which were all companies where people got really excited about exploration on earth of a certain region. So the South Sea Company, and this is gonna be a really sort of like politically bad example, this, they actually got a monopoly on the slave trade, slave trade to certain islands. But there's other examples. There's um, 
something called the Mississippi Company. And as the name implies, this was a lot about the Mississippi region and specifically about Louisiana. And there was also something called the Bengal Company, which as the name implies was, was about the exploration of the Bengal region in India. And all three of those stocks went through massive bubbles on the South Sea Company, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, <laughs> space connection, he lost most of his wealth in, in, in that bubble when it, uh, when it burst in the end. But this is just to say um, people, in the end, retail investors can get very excited about these opportunities, pour in a lot of money. And remember that money may not be lost. It may actually get invested in those projects and those projects may leave behind assets, developed assets, which are valuable for, for those regions. And um, of course, we've already mentioned the SPACs right now. I'm not saying for a moment that the SPACs are a bubble, but I mean, certainly uh, it's fair to say that the SPACs have generated the 11 SPAC announcements we have, we've had since Virgin Galactic have generated over five and a half billion dollars of financing inflow into the space sector. And, and the last um, thing on the lower right here is just for fun. A few years ago, I wrote an article arguing we should, we should issue a mass cryptocurrency to develop base, help develop the basic infrastructure on Mars. Um, I put here as the last bullet point that the key is to actually educate all of these groups, governments, uh, private actors, companies, retail investors, and I'll come back to that because I really believe that. Okay, uh, here quickly is something I developed, uh, we developed internally at E2MC, my fund uh, recently to explain to people why the space sector is in such a good moment right now. And if you start on the left, we think there has been some, there have been some elements which really give the impulse to the, the new space economy. And this was a combination, we believe, of government support, the government really um, doing partnerships with commercial actors, giving out large contracts like commercial resupply, and of course now with the, with the moon eclipse, and um, cost decreases via technology, so reusable rockets, CubeSats, and other things. And those initial impulses basically meant that suddenly a lot of business models became much more financially, economically viable than before, and some of them successful. That caught the attention, the attention of investors who started pouring in more investment money into space, but also of talent of people who thought, well, maybe I should be a space entrepreneur. And both of these things have effects. You, you get the entrepreneurs coming into the space sector, you get the money coming and that, that money that, that, isn't, that doesn't remain idle, right? This additional investment, it gets used for something, mostly for further research and development or for scaling up operations. If it's further R&D, it'll probably improve the technology even further if it's used for scaling up, it's going to improve the economies of scale. Either one of those two will mean that economics improve even further, making the business models and new business models even more economically viable. And then you go into a vicious circle. And this is really, hopefully, the really positive virtual circle we're in right now in new space in general. But I do believe, and so I've, slightly, I've taken the same slide and modified it for the lunar economy, that we can have a similar thing with the lunar economy right now, that if we do it right, Let's create a virtual circle. And if you start again on the left, two elements, one would be sort of the, the, the actions by government. And again, the more they can de-risk it for private actors, the better. And then of course we have technological innovations um, as well. And the one we keep coming back to is what we call the Starship Singularity. And then with those two impulses, hopefully we could start the same virtual circle of a more and more business models becoming viable on on the moon and of course there's also network effects between various business models which is not even portrayed on this page so in summary what i would encourage all of us to do right is things like educate as many people as possible about the moon because the the various people the investors the, the politicians the retail investors they can't do anything if they don't understand the moon right so get them excited be optimistic as a venture investor i'm always optimistic i'm always thinking about well what if something works and let's think about well what if it doesn't work right because i'm much more worried about some missing something really, really big, then something going wrong. Something goes always wrong in venture investment. That doesn't mean we have to be naive and blue eyed. Of course, we shouldn't do stuff that's that's stupid. That's obviously bad, like, you know, thinking that 200 launch companies will work out. But generally, we should be optimistic because if we're pessimistic, we're never going to get anybody excited to help and do the development. And so let's help to get that flywheel started that I just described and create a self-fulfilling prophecy of the lunar economy. Because remember, the best way to predict the future is to help create it. And so I stop here and hopefully that wasn't too much overtime and uh, happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Rafi, I appreciate that. And uh, it did it did go better after you switched networks. So that was helpful. Uh, leave, that, leave that screen up for a second. We only have a few minutes. We're actually a mild bit over time, but um, the, uh, the flywheel, go back to the flywheel for a second. Yeah, so 
what kinds of things I believe that you haven't made any any investments at all that are lunar focused businesses. Is that right? That's correct. We are currently in the final stages of looking at one of those businesses that I described as a potential dual use business, which the product would absolutely have a very important use on the moon. But the reason we are able to invest in it is because we think the same product can be sold and sold a lot on Earth as well. Okay, so is that is that your your criteria? Is that you have your clients, your uh, say portfolio companies, they have to be able to make money now in the real world, not some futuristic uh, version where they're mining ice, for example. Well, I think that there has to be revenue. At the end of the day, we need to get ideally an exit, a good exit for our investors within the lifetime of the fund. And I mean, yes, there's a way we can stretch that, you know, we can extend our fund by one or two years, we could um, sort of you know, sell an investment from our current fund into a successor fund, but typically you want to be able to exit within the fund's lifetime. So that means in many cases, there should obviously be revenues or profits, or at least the company advances in some other way. Maybe it's a low TRL company, but during the lifetime of the fund, it obviously, it has such obvious advances in TRL um, that it starts getting a lot more, um, it's, it starts building its uh, its customer book, it gets um, basically uh, contracts, um, it may get uh, more non-dilutive financing. So that value is crystallized in some other way. Great, and that is much more clear. Uh, it, I, I think it is safe to say that it is, uh, it is hard to be a moon business, it is hard to raise money for being a moon business and that's not going to change anytime soon, right? Yeah, the, the typical problem, Michael, is right now, and, and you notice is, so there's always some companies which have, for example, received very large contracts, right? I think we mentioned Astrobotics before, and there are several contracts. I think the largest one is almost $200 million. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the question to all of these companies that investors always will pose is, well, what comes after the contract? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. What happens if... Uh, I mean, you, you have some of, some of my VC colleagues who are less charming than me, and they basically, they, 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 one of them has the tagline, like, you're not a company, you're a contract. Yeah, yeah, no, it happens, it happens. All right, sir, thank you very much, appreciate it. We are going to move on to our next Thanks, speaker. Pleasure. Appreciate you being here, thank you. Thank you.